Ready? All right, three, two. This is Good Schools for All, a show from Voice of San Diego about how schools work and how sometimes they don't. I'm Scott Lewis. This week, an unprecedented charter school scam that cost California tens of millions of dollars with education reporter Will Huntsbury. Hello, Will. Scott, what's up? Okay, so tell me where this story starts. Well, so I think every good crime story has a suitcase full of cash in it, right? Hopefully, yeah. (laughs) Right. The A3 story has a version of that. So I want to start you with Louise Rigney. It's December 2017. We're in a bland office park in suburban Riverside County. Louise Rigney, he's a teacher and a principal for the A3 School Network. And he's got several suitcases full of student paperwork. And this student paperwork is worth about $5 million. Rigney is really sweating. He's really nervous because all of this paperwork, he's been asked to backdate it. He's been asked to sign for parents. He's been asked to fill in information. And that's so his superiors can essentially hand this paperwork off to the state and collect the $5 million. Wow. All right, let's start. What is A3? So A3 is a really huge organization, which Louise Rigney was a small part of. And it covered roughly half the state of California, all of Southern California, all the way up to Santa Cruz, east across the state, back down. It was a group of 19 online charter schools that could enroll students from all these territories that they were authorized in. And so you're talking about a pool of potentially millions of students. Um, And they were enrolling some students, which were very real, and utilizing their online curriculum in some kind of homeschool capacity. But then they also were enrolling students over the summer who were not really taking classes at all. And that's where somebody like Louise Rigney comes in. He's approaching summer football programs and he's getting those students to enroll with A3 over the summer. And so A3 can collect a portion of how much would be owed on a student for a year. In this case, we're talking about a couple thousand, three thousand dollars per student. And that's what the paperwork's about. Yeah, that's exactly what the paperwork's about. The paperwork is the money in this case. And if you are especially an online school with really low overhead, that paperwork can translate into a lot of dollars. And 11 people have been charged in what prosecutors say was basically a conspiracy to defraud California taxpayers. And at the top of this uh, alleged conspiracy, was Sean McManus, a guy from Australia who has been working in charter schools in California for the past several years, and another person, Jason Schrock, who was uh, kind of the front man of the business, prosecutors say. There was also an accountant who worked very closely with them. There was a man named Steve Van Zant. He previously had been charged and convicted with crimes related to charter schools as the superintendent of a small school district here in San Diego County. But but the net expands even wider. You know, you have um, people like Louise Rigney, who are the enrollment workers, trying to capture the students and the paperwork that translated to money. And then you had the football teams that were signing up and the coaches and the parents and some parents were getting highly suspicious along the way, but all these people ultimately got roped in and, and, you know, the full total that prosecutors say was taken was $80 million. Do we know anything about the culture inside the organization? 
I've heard from some teachers within the organization who talked about their love for the job and their love for the students they work with, but we also have some really strong insight into how McManus and Schrock were consistently pushing for growth and the workers under them who were helping grow those enrollment numbers. One person charged in the scheme was named Nyla Kreider, and she seemed to fill an office role where she was kind of overseeing some of these enrollment workers like Rigney. She also earned bonuses, and she also at one point just got a $25,000 raise. But uh, there are some text messages back and forth between her and one other person in her office that really give us some insight into this bonus culture and how money seemed to be at the heart of this operation. One person texted Kreider. She said, I had the weirdest dream last night. One was about us growing all Sean's schools. I was running all the Facebook campaigns and you were running around my office, drinking champagne, throwing money everywhere, yelling, I love bonuses. Hmm. So I think that gives you a bit of an insight into what people were thinking when they were enrolling these students and how it was more related to money than anything else. Mm -hmm. Kreider, she forwarded that text message to Sean McManus, I guess, because she thought he would get a kick out of it. And he said, wow, sounds like a party I want to go to. A3 is a very different kind of charter school. We hear a lot about charter schools today, and a lot of them operate almost exactly like a normal public school. They're a brick and mortar place with principals and teachers, cost a lot of money to operate them. But then there are also non-classroom based charter schools. Yeah. So a charter school is a school that tells the district, we want to educate kids in a new, unique way. The district makes essentially a contract with them, a, a charter. Uh, they get five years to prove that it works or not, and then they get renewed or, or declined after that. And this is a version of that? Yes, it's a version of that. They go to a school district. They ask if they can open up and run their unique education program. And in this case, they're saying, we're going to educate kids online only or mostly online. And you said it serves mostly homeschools? In a lot of cases, it would serve homeschool students. It could also just be someone who's kind of struggling in the traditional public school system. Maybe they're on the verge of dropping out or something like that. These schools actively target students like that as well. And now talk about how schools are funded, because it's not that each school gets a certain amount of money. It actually comes with the student, right? Right. Each child who attends a school essentially has a certain amount of money attached to them. And it can range from anywhere to about $7,000 to $13,000, depending on a lot of things. So let's just say each student basically comes with $10,000 attached to them. And these online schools, if they meet certain criteria, they can get $10,000 per student, just like a brick and mortar school. And what did Luis Rigney do? So Luis Rigney, we start with him and his suitcase full of student paperwork. He was a teacher for A3 schools. They quickly promoted him to principal, and then they expanded his role even further. And what they wanted him to do, according to his testimony, is help grow this charter school network. Um, And so get more kids and the money that's associated with them. Exactly. Growth means more kids, means more money. And so what Rigney did and several other people like him in the organization is they had a certain part of California that was kind of their field and they would reach out to football programs, cheerleading programs, swim programs, in some cases, the Boys and Girls Club. And, And what they would do is they would give a presentation and say, if you sign up your kids with our program, Sometimes they called it prodigy athletes. It operated under several different names. But they said, if you sign up with us, we can donate to you $25 per student you sign up. And in some cases, there would be even more money on top of that as well, like a weekly fee. 
And then they would say, all you have to do is continue with your normal sports program, hand us over the paperwork for each student and logs showing that you did the football program and we'll give you the donation. And wait a second. So you're saying that A3 would sign them up as though they're students to continue doing whatever they're doing in these programs. That's exactly right. And and then the programs would get a kind of kickback for doing that. And this is all proven? It's all established? We have reams and reams of documents, checks that went out to different people. Um, in Rigney's case, the team would get $25 per student and he would get $25 per student. And so uh, Rigney ended up getting a check for almost $100,000 for his work enrolling students over the course of the summer of 2017. But all these programs, they're also getting checks for maybe $10,000, $15,000 as what's framed as a donation to them. Wow. So is A3 a for-profit? A3 is not a for-profit company. And so I started digging into their tax returns right away when this story broke and I saw their 2016 tax returns, for instance, and this is for a nonprofit company. So no one's supposed to be pocketing the profits. There's they, no equity shareholders of the organization. It's presumably overseen by a board of directors. That's right. A board of directors. And they brought in $14 million that year in 2016, but they only spent $3 million. About a million of that went to McManus and Schrock's salary. And so they're clearing these amazing profits, but it's not easy to put it in their pockets. And if you're running a nonprofit scam, that is the tricky part. How do you get the money out of the nonprofit and into your pocket? What prosecutors say is that $80 million was funneled into nonprofits and a couple of small for-profits that McManus and Schrock owned but they were only able to extract about $8 million out of those nonprofits. And that was by giving it to personal charities that they controlled. Or also, in one case, buying a house in San Juan Capistrano that cost $1.6 million. So, let me see if I understand this. Okay. You have an organization, a charter school. It really is serving some kids. But did it somehow get off track? Or did it just, was this the, the, the setup from the beginning? That's a really interesting question, and we don't totally know the answer. But what we do know is that McManus and Schrock got together with Steve Van Zant, who I talked about in the beginning, the former superintendent who was charged with crimes in relation to charter schools. Now he's running a kind of consultancy company to help people get started. They... McManus and Schrock bought a nonprofit online school that had already been authorized in Dehiza. Uh, Dehiza School District is a very small school district with one school here in San Diego County. And so relatively quickly, they moved from owning that school to trying to open up as many schools as they possibly could. And with each school they opened, they tried to look detached from. So they might have somebody like Louise Rigney sign the paperwork to want to open the school. And to the small school district, they just think oh, this is an individual wanting to open a charter school. They don't realize it's connected to this chain, this essentially the A3 charter school network. Including an East County superintendent are charged with stealing $50 million of taxpayer money in a charter school scheme. NBC7's Melissa here, they're, sa they're saying that she was in charge of collecting oversight fees for about 20,000 students, when in reality, the student body here is only 150. Among 11 uh, people afternoon. accused of using her charter schools to overbill the state out of taxpayer money. To get What's in it for a school district? to do that. Why not? It seems like a school district, at least the way we've understood it, has sometimes or often been hostile or at least skeptical of new charter schools come in. Why would they sign off on something like this? Right. Well, that's a really interesting part of the story in this case, because you had 19 different online schools across the state, and they were exclusively 
authorized by small school districts, school districts that are running one, two, three, maybe four or five schools. When those school districts decide to grant the charter, they're then entitled to oversight fees from the school. And these oversight fees can be really substantial. And in the case of Dehesa School District, they made at $1.2 million just off the 1% to 3% fees from the A3 charter school. So in, in this case, you know, I mentioned 11 people were charged. Nancy Howard, the superintendent of Dehesa, she was charged in this. Prosecutors essentially say she was complicit in helping the whole scheme work. So you have a small school district with very few students. It is It has an incentive to approve a charter school that comes by. We have a charter school that comes by that's run by this A3 network. The A3 network gets paid per student that it recruits. Is it recruiting students from outside that small school district? It is. If you're an online school, not if you're a brick and mortar school, but if you're an online school, you can operate in the district that authorized you with its one little schoolhouse and that entire county. So in San Diego, you know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of students. So ostensibly, the the school district is actually getting more students in to its area of coverage. Yeah, according to the grand jury transcripts, you know, when these people would approach small school districts, they would explicitly say, we're not going to take your students. It wouldn't necessarily be written into the contract, mean, but that was the understanding. You mean the small school district could be assured that its small student population would actually not be affected by this new entry? Exactly. We won't take your students, but we will give you a cut of all the money we're making. They have a school district, a small school district that uh, authorizes something like this, immediately gets the benefit of some of the fees that are paid off of that. Meanwhile, this network of schools is going as far and fast as it can to bring students in to sign up however they can get signed up, collecting the daily fees that come with those students, and then uh, not delivering an education? Or were they actually educating the students? So, you know, after I first got into the story, I got some letters back provided by lawyers associated with A3 from um, some teachers who were real teachers and a real guidance counselor in this school. So there absolutely was some level of an education happening for some students. And I think you know, what, what was true regardless is you had some real students. You had more fake students, according to these grand jury transcripts and what the people said. But for all of them, money is just rolling in like some floodgate has opened, you know, $10,000 in some cases per student. But absolutely, there is a real education program here attached with to curriculum from K-12. It's a company a lot of people have heard of. It's a for-profit, um, separate education company that provides curriculum. In some cases, it opens schools. A3 was using online curriculum from K-12 that they were then making available to these families. But obviously, the overhead for a school like this is completely different than a brick-and-mortar school like you and I might be used to. Yeah. We're an online news organization. We provide information. I don't know if I like where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we provide information online. There's nothing about online that is itself, skept, uh, you know, um, questionable. But it sounds like there is some vulnerability with online education. What did this case expose about that? Well, you're right. And in this case, the state of California tried to put in place some measures to make sure that online schools were doing a quality job educating students. But those measures that they put in place do not seem to have worked at all. Um, an online school, if it doesn't submit any paperwork, if it's an online charter school, it won't automatically receive 100 percent funding. It would only receive about 60 percent funding. But if they submit paperwork showing they're doing certain things, they can get the exact same amount of money as any other school. They have to meet three main tests. One is they're supposed to have 25 to 1 student-teacher ratio. 
They're also supposed to spend 80% of their money on educational services. That's very loosely defined what that means. And within that 80%, they're supposed to spend 40% of their budget on teachers. So they submit paperwork attesting to this. And then the state checks a box that says, okay, they're eligible for 100% funding. According to evidence that I've looked at in this case, A3 was not meeting those standards, but it was submitting paperwork saying that it was. And that appeared to be enough to clear the state hurdle. Fascinating. And get the checks. And get the checks. What happened to these? You mentioned two executives. Tell me about them and and, and what's happening now. So Jason Schrock and Sean McManus, the two executives, are both facing over 40 years in prison each for their role in this. Um, Everyone has pleaded not guilty except Sean McManus, who is from Australia. He's in Australia and the extradition process has not started yet. I think that's something that can be very slow and cumbersome. But I think this is a process that is going to play out over a couple of years. So this story, this this scandal broke. The prosecutors uh, were in San Diego that tracked this down. Yeah, this was a case broken up and by San Diego prosecutors. Um, we have something here that's been loosely referred to as the public corruption unit uh, for several years. And this is, I think, the biggest case by far that they've ever gotten on to. These are the people investigators say were behind an over $50 million corruption scheme built on the backs of children. Over time, this criminal enterprise funneled millions of taxpayer dollars. San Diego District Attorney Summer Steffen says ringleader Sean McManus. Now the DA says Jason they're working to extradite McManus from Australia. Meanwhile, the rest of the defendants. Are so you talked to San Diego's DA, Summer Steffen. She came in, talked about it. What did she have to say about it? Well, uh, DA Steffen, she first off said, I mean, this is a really difficult investigation for her office to undertake. You cannot, I mean, these are very smart people. And in general, fraud and economic fraud it has a higher level of criminal thinking and a pretty sophisticated. And so you have to bring a lot of resources and divert and focus on it and really determine. That she said it took possible. countless man hours and that it was one year in the making with the investigators and the lead prosecutors basically spending their weekends in the office. But she also said, you know, it was, I think she used the word disheartening for how easy it was. She felt like that such a scam like this with an online charter school could actually take place. And she even compared it to identity theft of basically um, A3 was stealing these children's identities and turning them into students, even when they weren't. It was it was extremely disheartening and disappointing. And in a sense, how easy it was in some respects um, was was really troubling. And this is why we're glad that people are looking closely at this case and what lessons Uh, can be learned from it. But, you know, it's almost like identity theft, like stealing a kid's identity through an, in some cases, through an athletic program where you're, you're paying $25 to get their identity. But now you can use that. I mean, to think of kids as not like human students, but as like a, like an asset just to, to make um, money is um, really, really difficult. And it it's sad because... But I think what argue. she's really hoping that the case will break open is changes at the state level, um, maybe tighter regulations on schools like this to ensure that bad actors can't exploit these loopholes in the state system. And that's always the harm is, is one bad apple starts to kind of spoil the whole batch. What happened to Luis Rigney? Mr. Rigney 
had a very emotional testimony in front of the grand jury. And he talked about how he'd had doubts really for months about what he'd been doing. And just from reading the transcripts, it appears that, you know, he broke down on the stand telling this story at least one time. But he said he was conflicted because there were these people who were big personalities in the charter school industry. He was a relatively new teacher. They were entrusting him with a lot of things, counting on him for a lot of things. There was a lot of money at stake. And so he, he kept doing it. But Mr. Rigney was, was not charged. And people who testified for the grand jury, they got immunity for their testimony in front of the grand jury. This has been Good Schools for All from Voice of San Diego. I'm Scott Lewis. To keep up with the entire season, be sure to subscribe. We'll have new episodes every two weeks for the rest of the year. If you want more stories about school and education from Will Huntsbury, you can get his newsletter, The Learning Curve. That's at voiceofsandiego.org or vosd.org slash learning curve. This show is edited and mixed by Nate John. The rest of the production team is Megan Wood, Adriana Heldes. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you in a couple weeks.